Celebrity, part three. I'm sorry, I lied about the dragon. No, no dragon. I got pachyderms, the proverbial pachyderms in the room. A few years ago, I invited some of my older friends to a club where young YouTube stars were performing. We stood at the back of the room so we could take in not only what was happening on stage, but the audience as well. My friend watches for a bit, and then he leans over and says one word in my ear. Elvis. He wasn't talking about the performance, but the fan energy. He was flashing back to the generation of girls who were teenagers when he was a teenager. Now they're grandmothers, great-grandmothers. But they screamed for Elvis Presley. An even older generation of teenage girls who are now in nursing homes and, sadly, graveyards, screamed for young Frank Sinatra. In the 60s, teenage girls who are now mothers and grandmothers screamed for the Beatles. And today, teenage girls who are still teenage girls scream for Joey Graceffa. Joey Graceffa. Some of my older viewers will not have heard of Joey Graceffa. I hadn't either until last summer at Chris Perillo's Vlogger Fair in Seattle. Joey stepped out from behind a curtain and suddenly the room got really loud, very loud. If you'd like to hear about YouTube celebrity from an actual YouTube celebrity, Joey's your man. He put up a video following his most recent convention appearance and titled it, I Felt Like Justin Bieber. Hope that doesn't mean he felt like walking through a restaurant kitchen and peeing into a mop bucket. Yeah, Justin Bieber did that. Odd series, isn't it? Sinatra, Elvis, The Beatles, and Joey Graceffa? I'm not knocking Joey. I'm sure he's a delightful, wonderful person filled with talent, joy, charm, and charisma. But still, one of these things is not like the others. One of these things does not belong. Unless you're accustomed to the wacky world of YouTube celebrity, where Mad Boss Internet Famous is as good as actually famous. Maybe better, because we think we know these guys. Apparently you get extra points just for being one of us. One of us. Google gobble, Google gobble. We accept you. One of us. Where did we get this craving to become celebrities, to be noticed by celebrities? And when did we start giving celebrities all this power over us? Some anthropologists claim they can trace it back to the Stone Age. I'll visit that in the extras, but for now let's just go back to the Victorian Age. The early Victorian Age. It's five years after the fall of the Alamo, 1841. Berlin. Franz Liszt. Classical pianist, composer, steps onto the stage, and the crowd goes wild. Wilder than any crowd has ever gone before, at least since the Gladiator Games at the Roman Colosseum. Liszt provoked a massive wave of fan zaniness wherever he played. This guy. No, oh, not this guy. That's old Liszt. This guy. Yeah, that's 30-something Franz Liszt. Women fought over his gloves, his handkerchiefs. There was one lady in waiting at the court who saw him toss a cigar into the street and she snatched it up, still wet and reeking, encased it in a diamond-studded locket and wore it around the court, ignoring the fact that it was really stinky. That's 30-something list. Want to see young Franz list? I don't know if your heart can stand it. Brace yourselves. Okay? Total babe. They called it Listomania. They actually called it Listomania. Well, not they. He. The poet. The poet Heinrich Heine coined the term. He described it as a veritable insanity, one unheard of in the annals of furor. I love that. The annals of furor. Wouldn't you like to spend the afternoon consulting the annals of furor? The behavior was so unusual at the time, Heine thought he must be witnessing the birth of some brand new disease. And he gave the disease the name Listomania. He even consulted, quote, a physician whose specialty is female diseases, unquote, to help him figure it out. I don't think he did. I'm not sure anyone has. I don't know if there's a cure for it. Bear in mind, in Liszt's day, there were no teenagers. None. That's hard to imagine, but the word didn't even exist. Didn't need that word. Back then, you were a child, and then boom, you're an adult. Off you go to the factory, go get married, make more children. It's a binary life. You're a zero or a one. Nothing in between. Gap year? <laughs> How did the world get from no teenagers to teenagers everywhere? Well, that started in the early 20th century. Young people staying in school longer, preparing for new kinds of jobs, automobiles giving them range, independence, a portable make-out parlor. A new stage of life emerges, extended adolescence. In capitalism, you know what that means? That means we have a new market segment, a new opportunity to sell stuff. Once you discover a new market segment, first you label it, and then you develop products for it. The label, teenager. First used in 1941, not widely used until the 1950s. That's when selling to teenagers becomes a booming business. Music, rock and roll, movies, Rebel Without a Cause, TV shows, Dick Clark's American Bandstand, pharmaceuticals, Clearasil. Before long, authors are writing young adult fiction. S.E. Hinton's The Outsiders. It's a tough job being a teenager. What's the job? You have to declare independence from mom and dad and invent the adult you're going to be for the rest of your life. Psychologists have their own techno babble for what teenagers need to accomplish. They call it 
the separation individuation process. And a lot of it happens in the imagination. Teenagers spend a lot of time fantasizing. They try out scenarios in their head. They play out an imaginary life in front of an imaginary audience. See how they'll be noticed, how they'll be thought of. If they do this or that, if they wear this or that. The media took on the job of feeding us an endless clip file to work with role models we could slot into our fantasies, kind of Lego blocks to build our imaginary future selves with. One of the blocks they provide is the teen idol. Casting calls go out for good-looking young guys, very smooth-faced, slightly androgynous, non-threatening, clean. Non-threatening is the key. Their role is to slip comfortably into a budding romantic fantasy. You know what word was used to describe these guys? Dreamy. Teen idols were dreamy. Not quite real. Unfortunately for the young men who got these gigs, teen idols have a strictly limited shelf life and a brutally unforgiving sell-by date. Most teen idols lose their fan base as soon as they start getting a little too manly, too rugged to plug into a safe non-sexual fantasy. And they have to move up or move out. Move up and become real stars like Leonardo DiCaprio and Justin Timberlake, or more likely move out and on to their next career, which too often is robbing convenience stores to pay for their drug habits. The entertainment industry tosses away teen idols like used Kleenex. It's a very hard fall. For young teenage girls, the teen idol serves as a kind of training wheels, or what the British call stabilizers, for learning to ride that bicycle built for two. It's totally safe sex. Not only do you keep your clothes on, you aren't in the same room, not even the same city, and it's not even sex. Young fans usually don't want to imagine having sex with their idols. They just want to be noticed by them, hang out with them. They want to be with them, not be with them. Fast forward, 21st century. Here is psychologist Daniel Lapsley in 2005. Now, before I read you what he said, let me just remind you where we were at 2005. That's the year YouTube was founded, but there were no vloggers quite yet, unless you count Zay. American Idol was in its third year, and the UK X Factor was in its second year. MTV's The Real World had been running for more than a decade. Reality shows were everywhere. The idea that anybody could become a celebrity was in the air. Social media? MySpace ruled. Facebook was available only on a few university campuses. Twitter was a year off. Tumblr, two years off. Nobody had an iPhone. That was two years in the future, much less an Android, three years in the future. Traditional media, Doctor Who was revived. George Lucas finally spits out the last of those dreadful prequels. Goblet of Fire is released. And best of all, the Colbert Report goes on the air. Here's what Professor Lapsley said in 2005, the last year before vloggers. The danger is that if these adolescents don't curb all this daydreaming with a healthy dose of reality, they could end up in relationships that are manipulative or exploitive. Basically, after spending so much time in front of an imaginary audience, they might ultimately only be interested in forming relationships that serve their need to be admired instead of forming ones that authentically engage other people. Was he close? What do you think? Flash forward from 2005 to today. What happens to the teen idol business? Two important changes. First, with YouTube, Bandcamp, Instagram, etc., etc., the teen idol business comes loose from its corporate moorings. Now, good-looking, slightly androgynous, smooth-faced guys can freelance. Anybody with the right look can get into the teenage idol business for himself. You don't need a TV show or a record deal. Second, without that corporate mooring, freelancing, teen idols don't get handlers to keep them away from fans. In fact, now, thanks to social media and Skype and gatherings and conventions, there are now many new pathways between fan and idol, two-way channels that never existed in the 20th century. Communications options are new and multiplying. The slopes are slippery. Fantasy can slide into reality. As a culture, we've granted a lot of power to celebrities. They have an advantage over infatuated fans. But something about the YouTube mythology that we had, and all YouTubers are equal, obscured that. Made it possible for some creators to ignore the fact that their very presence was a kind of pressure. Well, that mythology was false. Even Hank Green, one of the high priests of the old religion, has recanted. He recently wrote, I've spent my career arguing that the gap between creator and consumer of creations was closing. But now I'm realizing it's always been there. It's always going to be there, and pretending like it isn't is a recipe for unpleasant relationships. Unpleasant relationships sounds like a vague and obscuring euphemism, but I can't see the truth from where I sit, so I'm going to leave it at that. Nothing stands still. YouTube is less and less the world of the freelancer. YouTubers have agents now. They affiliate with multi-channel networks. One of those networks is being absorbed by Disney. Another is rumored to be selling to Time Warner. So let's see where we are in a year. Hank has convened a community-based task force. It's called You Coalition, and it's undertaking a systematic, very responsible, large-scale response to this issue of sexual abuse and harassment. They are working methodically and carefully, not jumping to conclusions based on no data. You can follow their work and join it. There's a link in the description. Meanwhile, I'm hopeful people are getting better educated about the fan-creator dynamic, what does and does not constitute consent. I don't know if behaviors will change anytime soon. We'll have to see. Until next time, I'm Mikola.
DVD extras, are you ready to meet some Stone Age celebrities? Professor Jamie Terrani of Durham University says, as a species, we evolved and learned survival skills by making celebrities of people in the tribe that had high skills. Unlike other species where dominance is strictly a matter of brute force, humans developed a ranking based on prestige and reputation. That's a powerful cultural transmitter and very old. Professor Terrani warns there may be some gotchas in it in a fascinating article I'll link to. Professor Kirsten Hawks at the University of Utah finds modern examples of that among the Hadza tribes. Their hunters could go for an easy kill of a guinea fowl and bring it home to their families, but instead they go for big game, which is not only harder and more dangerous, but it winds up giving them so much meat they have to give most of it away. Why do they do that? Fame. Prestige. Better marriage prospects. They get what we would call subscribers. Fans. People who look up to them as role models. There's nothing inherently wrong with role models and heroes. That's how we learned. It's apparently how we've always learned. The trick is picking your role models and deciding what it is you want to learn from them, what you should ignore. Will there be a part four in this series? Yes, there will, but not immediately. I'm going to move on to other topics and then I'll come back to this one. I think there's a lot more to say about fame and celebrity. Here's Jerry Graceffa telling you why he feels like Justin Bieber. Here's my new favorite video on this topic. It's from Chewy Sand, Hazel Hayes. It's part of a playlist with nine other really strong entries on the topic, including one from Karen Cabot, one from Anthony D'Angelo. If you missed part one of my rants, give it a watch. Here's part two. Bye now. Thank you.